Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's presentation. This is the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's good to be with you all again for another edition of our weekly program, broadcast by us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and organized by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. Every week, just about, we gather right here at the museum's YouTube page at noon on Wednesdays to meet interesting people and learn interesting things. You can sort of get a sense for what's going on in the world of science and the environment, especially throughout the state of North Carolina by tuning into this program all the time. We get to meet fascinating people uh, who really are doing incredible work out there, helping us learn more about the natural world and the ways in which they share it with people all across the state and sometimes even around the world. Now, here on our YouTube channel, there are, is just a fantastic resource of videos that you can take advantage of. Make sure that you check out the Lunchtime Discovery playlist here on our YouTube channel because there are dozens and dozens of these presentations on all kinds of topics. So make sure that you check on that regularly or, you know, you've got some time, you feel like learning something new, you can turn on our YouTube channel and find something interesting there. It's a great resource for you that I hope people take advantage of. As we go throughout today's presentation, though, one of the best things about the Lunchtime Discovery Series is that it is interactive. You don't just have to sit there, eat your lunch, watch and listen. You can also engage with us. Jump into the chat on YouTube or the comments if you happen to be watching on Facebook. You can leave your questions, thoughts, stories and experiences there for us, and we'll share those. I will share those with our guest speaker at the uh, end of the program, we move into our audience question and answer segment. And let me tell you, uh, today's guest speaker loves audience questions. I think they're his favorite thing in the whole wide world, in addition to uh, to sharing stories about North Carolina's biodiversity. Today's guest is the ornithologist for the Museum of Natural Sciences, our curator of ornithology, that's birds, John Gerwin. Hey, John. John, I can't hear you. There we go. We were muted. Hey. All right. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Well, take it away. All right. Go ahead and get the uh, ubiquitous PowerPoint here shared. We'll go into presentation mode. It always takes a second. Um, it's good to be back, filling in for you. And so, um, yeah, as indicated, I've been working in the Uwaris region of Central North Carolina for uh, a number of years, off and on. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot more, <clears throat> specifically bird work. But what I wanted to talk about today was more than birds. Uh, there's a lot more to the Uwaris region than just just some of the bird work we're doing. And that's what I wanted to show showcase. <clears throat> So first, where is, you know, where are we in the state? Here's a, a graphic for showing the general bio regions that um, habitat regions we talk about, their, their physiological or <laughs> physiognomy as well. The uh, mountains, Piedmont, there's two coastal plains. We have the sand hills. The Uwaris is in the region there with the greenish yellow square. So it's essentially central North Carolina. And so it's part of the Piedmont, really. So it's an interesting part where in the Piedmont we have these these small mountains. And this is a quick uh, bit of geology for how it came about. So there's an ancient land mass for North North America. And it was a long time ago, so approximately 450 uh, million years ago, we have these two land masses coming together. So you've got the, the Gondwana land, which uh, many of us have heard about. There's the Laurentia land mass. And when they came together, that was... Um, that was our beginning for the, the Piedmont part of North Carolina in, in a simplified way. Um, so it's a it's a it's a old old region, old rocks. And here is part of where we're where we're going. So it's south uh, west south of Greensboro, southwest of Ashboro. That's sort of the area that we consider the Piedmont. And it's in two hours from Raleigh, hour and a half to two hours, you can be in any number of these places, for example, 
the uh, Burkhead Wilderness is just southwest of Asheboro. Mar Mountain State Park, I consider sort of the furthest southwest of the Uwari's region. It's the third order, oldest state park near the Uwari National Forest. And um, of course, the zoo is in the Uwari region. So a number of places and a number of things you can do to do outdoor recreation. Uh, pretty close to Raleigh, a lot of people skip over the Uwari's region and go up to the our higher mountains, the Southern Appalachians. And, um, and I love working in the Southern Apps too, but it's been wonderful to spend time in the Uwari's. And again, I can be there. Uh, our study site is only 90, 90 minutes really from my house if there's not too much traffic. So what is Uwari? That's an interesting word and interesting because we don't know where it comes from exactly. Um, you know, there's some indication it might have been from the Swala Indians. We're not sure. There's early usage of the term. It was spelled this way in 1701. There's a early map that has it listed this way. Um, there's another map where it's listed this way, but nobody is sure where that word comes from. So that the region is um, what we call really the oldest rocks. People refer to them as the oldest mountains. The, the, um, the peaks out there, the highest ones are about a thousand feet. Um, the highest one I've worked on goes up to about 904 feet above sea level. So again, it's from rocks that a uh, chain of volcanoes of about 500 million years ago. Another interesting thing is that the, the first, really the first gold rush took place out there. Um, gold was discovered right around 1800. Um, there, there was a lot of interest during the 1820s and 30s in doing gold mining in the region. And then that was preempted when uh, gold was discovered in California. Some other interesting rocks out there like the rhyolite, granite. <clears throat> and it's, um, you know, when I've talked to geologists about the region and read about it, they all just say, well, it's a complex region. It's kind of debated still some of the the, uh, the history behind it, some of the uh, what, what exactly went on. But what you see when you look out there is that a lot of the rocks started off as in volcanic beginnings and then they're reworked by sedimentary processes and then subjected to metamorphosis. And so it is a complex, geologically complex region and there's still still a lot of work to be done on the geology of that region. And so all that complexity too helps us with um, bringing in a complex different kinds of habitat. So it it's, you know, again, it's in the Piedmont, but I don't consider it quite the Piedmont the way I think of Piedmont around Wake County and um, nearby places because it's, you know, typically pretty flat. We have a few rolling hills, but in the UR, we have a lot more um, topography. So we have the elevation going up to about, as I said, about a thousand feet for some of the uh, high peaks. And it's also pretty steep So and different slopes and different aspects to those slopes. So you've got north, south, east, west, that brings you... Um, uh, different amounts of sunlight or, or moisture gradient. Different rivers, creeks lent it. There's disturbances, whether they're natural storms, the hurricanes, of course, come through, uh, or uh, in timber operation, you've got these disturbances, and all that leads to a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of different habitats. Uh, just to show you real quick on the map here. So um, if you can see the pointer, so here's a very, here's an area with a lot of very steep topography. These are essentially cliffs. They might be wooded, but walking up and down this would be pretty difficult. Um, whereas if you go over here, once you get to the top here, you can see where the, the um, contour lines open up. That's a flat a flat top. And then you've got the small second order streams running through. We've got the Uwari River that runs through the primary river. Um, all of this gives us these different types of habitats up there. I've been part of the Greater Uari's Conservation Partnership for a number of years. It's a consortium of agencies, uh, which are listed here just to promote natural and uh, human economic diversity. Um, for, for my part, I try to take lead uh, trips out there with our colleagues here at the museum. And, and there's a lot of hiking, there's biking, there's horseback riding, um, people ride their ORVs, through the National Forest, there's trails specifically for the ORV, a lot of camping, that sort of thing. So the Uwari River itself is one of the least uh, polluted um, rivers in the U.S. It um, had several dams removed. My colleagues with Fish and Wildlife Service have succeeded in getting several dams taken out. It 
it may now be completely undammed, which is an unusual thing for rivers in the east. Um, and so that, that there's a lot of interesting aquatic aquatics that go on. I don't I don't talk about the aquatics um, in this talk, but there's some interesting, for example, the freshwater bivalves, crayfish, some interesting biodiversity underwater. So again, I'll describe some of the projects that have gone on out in this region, who, what, why. Um, that I, I don't really say much about like the bats or the herb surveys, but those have gone on. And there's a land trust in the region. They now they used to be called the Land Trust for Central North Carolina is the Three Rivers Land Trust. And uh, I've been uh, just part of doing some bird surveys and some research, and I'll touch on those. Um, I started this project to do uh, a bird banding, which is tagging birds, tag and release, back in the fall of 2015, in part because of the partnership, we wanted to have a, a little bit of a study going on. And we were able to start this on some private property uh, just south of the Burkhead Wilderness to uh, two sisters that own uh, over a thousand acres. And we, we, we were working on 250 acres that, have, that were formerly cat, uh, cattle pasture and, and restored into upland prairie, tall grass, meadow. And, and I worked with uh, colleagues at the Wildlife Resources Commission, as well as um, US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, a few more have joined now from the Wildlife Resources Commission. Uh, um, this is what the property looks like. Take a look at the, um, that mountain in the background and the tree on the right, because this area, uh, I'll show you a couple of slides. And, and um, to, in order to, to get it like this, it requires some maintenance, whether you mow or in, in this case, we burn the property every few years. It has to be, it has to be burned in order to maintain or to keep the uh, trees from encroaching on this so it's um pretty it looks pretty severe when it happens but but over but it only takes a few months for it to come back this is what it looks like afterwards there's the same that same mountain in the background but you saw how it looked after it's all said and done just a few months and all that vegetation grows back um and this is the way it all looks after a burn just give it give it a few months and comes right back and it, it it keeps things like these these sapling hardwood trees from, we don't want it to be a forest in this case, we're trying to keep it as an open space and meadow. Um, this is just uh, to show you uh, how, you know, how things are planned. So the blue the blue here is the Uari River coming down, but um, the red, the property where, where I'm working, um, this, we get folks like the uh, North Carolina Forest Service who often come out and do the contract burn and so they create these maps of how they're going to do it. and it's done at different in different years usually in a rotation. So these are some of the people that were that got started. I have worked with uh, teenagers through Wake Audubon and through the museum for a number of years and they helped me get this started back in 2015. They they still help me with a little bit of stuff 10 years later still hanging around. Um, uh, Ruth Ann is one of the one of the two owners out here and um, one of my students from Guilford College and their Laura from the Fish and Wildlife Service, they all helped us get this started. And so we, uh, when we're doing our bird work, we go out and set out these nets. They're like giant volleyball nets <clears throat> and the birds fly in and they're pretty stretchy nets and the birds fly in and then they sink, they sink into the netting. So it's, it's kind of like a giant spider web really. And we come along like giant spiders, take them out, do some processing, get some data. It's just some quick, quick data. Um, actually, back you know, here they're working on, we're in the fall, we're working on, we catch a lot of sparrows out there. Up to seven species of sparrows migrate through or into the into this property and spend the winter. And there's a few that breed, but um, a lot of them are migrants. So here's, for example, different, different species down here. And the, sort of the pattern, we're looking for patterns in this case. We see that the one that's the olive green, this is a song sparrow. We see a lot of them show up about now, mid-October. And then by uh, first two weeks in November, we see big, a big pulse. Then the numbers drop. And then they're still around through the winter. So uh, it tells us that one, it's a significant area because some of these, some of the numbers we get are pretty high. And when we're doing our, our tagging, we might catch 50 birds, different birds in one day. Um, but they're in the fall, they're migrating through. Some spend the winter. We see about, I would say about 50% of the ones that we capture in the in October, November 
hang around through December into January. So about 50% stay, but the others are moving on. So it's telling us about this pulse of migration through the property. And then the other species do also, they have their pattern, but uh, and they're just in lower numbers, but there they are. So, you know, it's interesting to, to put this on a graph and then be able to talk to the land managers and the owners about uh, just just what goes on, you know, when during the time of the year. And, and for example, the white-throated sparrows, they tend to show up a little bit later. They're, they're here now in the area, but we tend to see more of them in uh, November and December. We tend to catch them more uh, later on. So they, they just tend to come a little bit later. Um, if you look closer at the song sparrow, again, you can see um, in this case, um, we got a little bit more data and we got a few more birds in October and then they start to taper off November, December, right on through the winter, about 50% of what we got earlier. We, uh, and this just shows we don't get many breeding. There are not many song sparrows that breed on the property. Um, some of the other interesting points we get, like here's a field sparrow. They do breed on the property. They also winter on the property. This is the bird that we caught in December. And uh, we didn't, when we catch them in the winter, we don't know what sex they are. This was a young of the year bird. We can age them up to their uh, first year. The bird was recaptured two years later, a year and a half or so. It was in the middle of May. So now it's in a breeding season and we can tell it's a male because uh, there are ways we can tell the males from the females during the, in the breeding season. So on the site, it may have been one that was born and raised on the property that we don't know. But um, those are sort of the things, patterns we get. Here's another bird that, another sparrow that, they only come here in the winter, fall in the winter. This bird was caught in 2016 and it was caught again in October of the following year. And it was, see that a lot of these birds, even though this is a bird that breeds mostly in the Northern US, New England say, and um, in Canada, and, and yet they come to these areas and also, uh, we see a lot of white-throated sparrows all around North Carolina in the fall and the winter. And it just looks like, well, they can go anywhere. But in fact, these individual birds are coming back to the same spot. The nests are, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60 feet long. So these birds are occupying an area, just probably a couple hundred square meters. And they're so tied to their sense of space. And we see that over and over. We get about 10% of the birds that we tag. We will recapture them in subsequent years. And they are, uh, and we usually get them in the same net or, or a net that's nearby. They're very tied to their sense of, of place. And uh, the, here's nine species of sparrows. These are just a diversity, showing you the diversity of sparrows that we get. Some of them, like the song sparrow here, that's the one that we catch a lot of, as well as uh, the white-throated sparrow here. We don't catch many of this one over here, the Lincoln sparrow. It's just really uncommon here. Or, or white crown sparrows are common, but we do catch them. Um, and some days in the fall, we might get seven of these in one day. Um, so the Uwaris is, um, as a region, is pretty significant. It's it's a bit fragmented, of course. There's a lot of urban, it's, you know, bounded by, um, I would say, you've got Greensboro to the north and Ashboro, then you've got Charlotte to the southwest. Um, and even, even to the east, you know, you're starting to get into, say, the uh, Chatham County region is growing so um, and Highway 85 to the to the west of it. So you've got you've got a lot of fragmentation going on. So but it's still fairly uh, open space, fairly forested, as well as these open areas and a lot of agriculture. So it's uh, significant for a lot of biodiversity and, and you know, including these birds, even the, the regenerating areas like those early succession fields, like what we're ma maintaining with the meadow on the property. It's really important. There's usually a lot of fruit in there. We catch a lot of forest bird. We catch a lot of forest birds that are out in the meadow because in the fall, when they're migrating, there's a lot of fruit. There's a lot of pokeberry and a lot of blackberry. So we get things that are what we would consider birds that are more northern birds. We get some birds that are maybe a little bit to the west or a little bit to the east. In other words, they're birds that um, they kind of blend right here. I'll show you a couple of examples of what I mean. So here are two tanagers that we got. Scarlet tanager is typically in the southern Appalachian Mountains, and then, then they breed in North Carolina into the Piedmont and into the Uwaris, but it's typically a higher elevation bird, and it's uh, really fond of oak hickory forests. And then summer tanagers here on the right, um, 
they're typically in a coastal plain and then into the Piedmont, and they're typically lower elevation. But in the Uwaris, we get them both, and we often will see them in the same tree. I've, I've had them a number of times in the same tree. And it's an interesting crossover that, that occurs in the Uwari region with some of the, some of the birds. Um, there's another a night bird called the whippoorwill, now called the eastern whippoorwill. We've split it from the birds in the southwest and other two species. Um, so this bird had been declining, and the uh, so here we are in North Carolina. The Uwari's in the center part of the state. Uh, this is a migratory bird, and anyway, there's been some concern for it as a long long-term population decline. But the Uwari's region, uh, when we're out there, we we camp and we've done some nighttime surveys. The uh, the Uwari's region is full of full of whippoorwills, so it's still a great area for this bird, and it would be a good area for someone to do some studies um, because there's so many. We don't know much about the uh, the, uh, the it's sort of life cycle because it's a nocturnal bird, so it requires a different way of, of studying them. But with these new tracking technologies, <clears throat> um, it's a good time to someone to go out to the Uwari's. And uh, here's a young one. Somebody found a, a, a chick one time. They nest on the ground. So there it is. So I'll switch over is the uh, um, part of my marker slide to switch to some different uh, different things. But this is a cliff swallow, um, and this is an example of a bird that has taken advantage of some man-made objects, human-made objects. So these birds, by you can guess by its name, it likes to be on a on a cliff, but it's not on a cliff in the Uwari's. It's on bridges, and across North Carolina now, cliff swallows have taken up on on bridges, and they they build their nest on the uh, vertical concrete wall of the bridges. So there's a couple of places in the URs, including on Highway 109 over the URI River, there's a big colony uh, breeding. Them. Breed in the URI's region. So, um, and we've, we've caught and tagged all of these. Um, it's a again, it's interesting for the diversity. Birds like this, these two on the lower left, the Louisiana water thrush, the prothonotary, and even this one, the yellow throated, they're primarily along the waterways. Um, birds like the this prairie warbler here in the meadow, the black and white and the warm eating here, they're in the forest. Um, here's a Louisiana water thrush. It is tied, it is tied to water. They forage at the edge of the water. They're eating aquatic insects. <clears throat> so they depend on clean water like the rest of us. Um, interesting way of nesting. They nest in places where there's the tree roots are exposed. So if there's flooding uh, and scour the bank where a tree falls and exposes the roots, this is where they put their nest. I was able to get up a little closer. So there it is. Oh, and I, uh, the best I could do was put my camera up and turn the flash on. But there, there are a couple eggs for this one bird's nest. Um, we don't have a lot of nest data for this bird because it's typically hard to get to these places along the um, first and second order streams where they typically nest. Um, another bird that, that breeds in the forest that I uh, showed on the previous slide is a worm-eating warbler. One of the things that we're, we're always uh, concerned about is this is not a worm-eating warbler. This is a brown-headed cowbird. So this is a case where you've got a parasite, a parasitic bird. The, um, the cowbird lays its eggs in these other birds' nests. In this case, these chicks, these, these are warbler chicks. They're pretty old. So in this case, it looks like everybody's going to fledge. But in a lot of cases, on a, on a on a open cup nesting bird that builds its nest up in the shrubs or trees, that cowbird will toss the baby birds, the host babies, out of the nest, and so all you're left with is cowbird. And at low at low population densities for the cowbird, that's okay; it's sustainable. They make enough of the host species, but if the um, if things get out of balance, and sometimes they do, then the, the cowbird becomes a problem. And those are just some of the things that we keep an eye on when we're out doing what we do. Here's another ground nesting warbler. I showed you the picture of the black and white before in the hand, um, but here she is on her nest. So she's another ground nester, typically uh, on a slope. And when there's you know, been some rainfall and, and such, and it causes the leaves to float down a little bit, and then they pile up, say, at the base of this sapling, and causes like a, it's like a nice little uh, porch overhang. She will build her nest underneath. I have found half a dozen or so nest just by walking along and accidentally flushing the bird off. And then here's some more warblers that we get during migration. So during the spring and during the fall, we get other species that pass through just like those sparrows that come and go. 
Um, these are some of the birds that also come and go, different kinds. <clears throat> One of the birds that does breed in the region is called the black throated green warbler. And so we did a little uh, extra work with the bird. Here's one up close. We This is a forest bird. We went into the national forest. There was interest in learning more about this bird because they're, it's a somewhat isolated population. So here's a map showing showing a bird. This is just showing the, the abundance of birds from some surveys that have been done around this breeding range. And then here, just to show that you can see in North Carolina, there's a little bit on the coastal plains, some populations, and then they reach our area also in the mountains. So they come down the Allegheny into the Southern Alps, and then that's it. And then there's this little isolated population here. It doesn't show up on the map uh, too small, and that's the Warriors birds. And so we went out to do a little bit of work with them. So it can, it's both a migrant and a breeder. Uh, in our region, it breeds from late March to June, it may it may breed further. A lot of these birds will keep breeding into early August. We don't know. Um, it, uh, we don't know when it does its molt actually, probably in July, but maybe August. Uh, the Northern migrants are coming through right into October. Right now, there's still some passing through on their way to uh, Mexico and Central America. So we've got these isolated populations and some recent work was done to show that there are some genetic differences between the coastal plain birds and the other birds up uh, um, up in the mountains. Um, and it just shows that in South Carolina, there's a little isolated population as well. Uh, and when they, the uh, breeding in the mountains, they reach down into just the northwest corner of South Carolina, northern Georgia, and then the mountains of um, North Carolina. Here's our little populations here in North Carolina. They're just isolated in the, where, in the coastal plain, these little isolated populations. And anyway, so we don't really know why or they, they, a lot of the, the natural history of this species. Um, that just hasn't been studied. But here's how the here's the difference between coastal plain and the mountains, the, the extreme differences. The word birds in the coastal plain have a much reduced black throat. Uh, <clears throat> that, that's sort of the main difference between them. Uh, we don't know the basic biology yet of this bird. I've only found a couple nests in all my time out there. Typically, they're but we just they're just things a lot of things about it that we don't know. We think we know most everything about things as common as birds, but we don't. So I know it's just a lot we don't know. But one of the things we did was go out. So this part of the of the Uwari, so it's over by Baden Lake. There's some peaks. Um, there's an arrowhead campground here. We were able to base out of, go up on the mountain slopes, catch some birds. We put some transmitters on them just to, just to follow them around and get an idea of uh, of their uh, how they use the space. We, we they respond to play back to their song, so we can put a model out, play the song. The males come in and they they fly into the net. They don't realize there's a net there. So here we are setting up a net. We put the model out catch a few birds, and then we put these um, transmitters on them. They're small. We use a leg loop harness, tie them on. The tiny little transmitter weighs less than half a gram. These birds weigh about 10 grams. There's a little frequency to the transmitter, and we go out with our receivers, antennas, and follow the birds around and um, get some data on just where they are on the landscape. So there's one of my uh, former students. She still volunteers with me. She's putting on uh, putting a transmitter on a bird. So we go out and we're able to go out and find the birds. We can hear that sound of a transmitter out in the woods. We can be about 500 meters away. It depends. If the bird's way up in the treetop, we can probably be 800 meters away and pick up a signal and go find the bird. But these are birds that are breeding, so they're not going very far. And, 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 and our point was, how far are they going? How much space are they using? So here are six birds that we tagged one year. And on this little mountain here, you can see that they pretty much keep to their place, but they do overlap. And here the orange one was infringing on yellow a bit. Here the pink one's going into the blue guy's territory, the blue guy's going into green. We saw, see, see that a lot, other, other birds that we've studied as well. They, um, they all roam around and get in each other's space. Um, what we also found, if you notice, here's this slope is going from northwest to southeast and the birds are over on the northeast side. This this is a double slope. You've got an east-west ridge and a north-south ridge. And again, the birds are over on the north-northeast side. And that's what we found even doing surveys out there with the species. We went around to some of the other peaks 
did uh, surveys for the bird, and they're always on that north northeast aspect. Um, and they also wanted to be on the slope, sometimes on top, but almost never in a, down in the valley, so to speak. They weren't. They wanted to be on the slope. So there are different factors to what I call abiotic as well as biotic. Something about that slope and also the aspect, the north northeast aspect. That's the more humid and the more cooler aspect of a mountain. The southwest side here is the hot and dry side. And this is the, remember, this is a bird that's mostly up north. So this is a bird that um, prefers a cooler, more humid microenvironment. And they seem to have found that here in the URs where it's an isolated population, but they found this microclimate here. So they show up in mid-April, they come back pretty early. Um, we found some fledglings as early as the, at the end of the first week of May. Anyway, so that's kind of interesting. So how much space did they use? Um, uh, up to up to 10 acres, but in general, uh, they were using around four to seven acres of for their uh, home range. And the orange birds, um, they look more like the nominate, which is the southern app bird, which is the one up north, not the coastal plain one. <clears throat> so again, it just here's some more examples of some other birds that we did. Again, you can see close up how they overlap. In space, we can we can we're taking what we do is when we find the bird, we take a GPS point and we can take that GPS point, put it into the computer software and map it out. So here's here's a, the uh, the six birds, but here we're zooming in just to show you exactly what they're doing and the lines that are drawn. The computer is telling us that this inner circle is where this bird is probably spending 50 percent or more of its time, and um, it's an estimate. It's an estimate based on some some higher math and based on the data that we give it. But this allows us, you know, again, to overlay these data on different kinds of maps and to understand a little bit more about what the what this bird is doing out there. Um, so, so I'll switch just to some of the other diversity, uh, interesting things. So different flycatchers come through the region. And here, these two are pretty regular. We have these Acadian flycatchers that breed on the site in the woods. We get the willow flycatchers that breed in the area and they migrate through. Two years ago, this was an interesting surprise when we were um, netting in December and, and we really only have one bird, one flycatcher in December. It's the Phoebe. And but yet we caught these two, which are related to these two. But they are from the West. This is a Western flycatcher. And this is one called a Hammond's flycatcher. They're from the Rocky Mountains and further west. So what were they doing in North Carolina? We don't know. It was that year. There were a lot of fires going on out west. Um, but it was interesting that of all the things to accidentally fly into our nets, this was on on a Friday, and then Saturday we caught this one. Um, it was quite a surprise to everyone, but it happens. Every year people find western species in North Carolina. There's a lot of uh, drifters out there. A lot of birds drift to the east, but anyway, it was an interesting thing. Uh, other birds show up in the region. Uh, we had a big year a couple of years ago where this bird, which is from the north-northwest, uh, breathing can across Canada um, showed up in many places in North Carolina. I, I had not seen very many of these for over 20 years. And then it was a big, big year. Um, and we saw a lot of them around the URI's region. They do come to feeders. It's called the evening grosbeak, uh, similar to cardinals with that big bill. They love sunflower seeds. And so there was um, the property owners, uh, parents live nearby and, and, uh, their mom loves to feed the birds, and she told us she had all these gross beaks at her feeder, so we went to see them one day. Um, it was pretty neat to see, but I would see them flying around, driving, just driving down the small roads out there. I'd see them fly over. So again, I, uh, the Three Rivers Land Trust is very active in the region. Uh, they work in about a, a lot of open space in those counties. One of the things they've been working on is reconstructing, reconnecting the, uh, the historic Uari Trail, which is a 50 mile trail. So it goes here it is from up here in the Burkhead wilderness and it goes on down and they're up to, I think, 45 miles. So they're essentially done. They had to work with some private landowners to get access uh, over time. What was public was now is now private, but they've done that. And there's a lot of other places that are through the private land, through the national forest, or or the land trust went ahead and got conservation easements put in on the land. So uh, there there's some of the places they've they've done work at this low water bridge area in 
in the region where they've worked on all four corners where the Uari River crosses under a road called, Lo uh, I forget the name of the road, it may be called Low Water Bridge Road, but um, on all four corners, they have purchased land and um, and they're doing, um, they've done some mowing or, or, or thinning of the trees just to get the forest in good shape and people can go out and, and hike along those properties. So. Uh, usually in early May, like the first weekend in May. If you want to go out on your own, <clears throat> strike out. There's been a great book written by our colleague, Don Childry. Um, he really loves to bike. That's his thing. Um, but he's biked a lot in the Uaris. And then a few years ago, he put together uh, a book because, you know, where you bike, you can hike or, or, or a lot of times you can take a horse. So anyway, he put together this great book. It's come out now in the second edition. It's full of great information, very detailed information, um, very specific directions on many, many of the trails in the Uari region. And so it's a great book to have if you want to just strike out and explore. And then just some of the other things that we discover when we're out there, when I'm uh, taking, like I said, I've taken different groups out there, uh, walking along, looking just at all the biodiversity. Here's a couple of Fungi, those who know me know I love purple and pink. Um, so here are a couple of purple fungi that we found on one of our hikes. A couple of other interesting ones. This is more like a, uh, you know, a puffball type. Um, and then this is one of the ammonitis. Some different uh, red ones, I guess getting close to pink. Different kinds that are there. Waxy cups and uh, scarlet cup, a rushula up here. Whoops, missed one. There are there are a lot of land snails. There's some real interesting diversity of land snails in the Uari region. And there's a recent publication by our colleagues up at Appalachian State University. I think it's out now. A few years ago, they were putting the finishing touches on it. So I don't know if the pandemic stopped them or not, but hopefully it's, it's I need to go look and find out because I love looking at the at the different land snails that are out there and taking pictures. I I usually don't know what they are, but that's the point of their publication. It was a publication on on just describing all the species that they have found in the Uari's region over the years. Um, there's an interesting, a uh, lot of arthropods out there, as you would expect. One of these is this uh, protean uh, shieldback uh, that takes the name Mormon cricket, um, apparently from a, a plague that, that happened long ago. Um, they typically walk more than they more than they fly but i have found them in the forest this is one that i found several times in the forest and apparently it's not real common at least not in north carolina uh one day i found a jumping spider and <laughs> and it's grabbed one of these shieldbacks one of these not so common uh protean shieldbacks for lunch We'll look at a few more spiders in a minute. Uh, here's one. This is a fishing spider that at the time, when I took this photo, probably, uh, I guess this was 2016, um, it was considered an, an uncommon species. Um, it may be more common now. A lot of people now are participating in iNaturalist, and we're getting a lot of interesting records because of, because of that. So it's very possible that this is now. A lot of times things are uncommon because who's out looking at spiders and taking photos? There aren't many of us doing that. So... Um, Anyway, more and more people are, thanks to programs like iNaturalist. There's a, another uh, new program started at NC Biodiversity, and there's a website, NC, I think it's nc-biodiversity.com, and you can load up photos. I've loaded some of my photos to that website. That's just for North Carolina stuff. Um, and NC Parks manages a number of, uh, I think, the NC Biodiversity data, and um, so you can find a lot of good information on NC Parks website as well for different groups of organisms like this so like this you can they have a spider a spider page as well there are some of the some of the different spiders i found just the, just a few of the uh the probably three times as many that i've photographed and documented there i think one of my favorites is this little uh, jumping spider here this little mustache jumping spider it's sitting on my finger it says uh, uh, a young one it was pretty tiny and i just happened to um Having a spot in before he ran off or jumped off. The uh, trapdoor spiders are really interesting ones. They uh, 
similar to the um, tarantula. A lot of moths out there. Uh, too too many to even begin, but this one is interesting. It blends into the bark really well. One of the underwings, but when it flies, it's got the uh, it, the hind wings are usually a pink, red, or orange color with black bands through them. But when it sits on the bark, blends right in. I happened to find a caterpillar one time and just crawling across. It also blended right into the to the path, which uh, looked a bit like an old dirt road. But um, then I flipped it over, and it's got this really neat coloration underneath. Some of the other moths that are out, uh, this is the only pine devil moth I've ever seen um, in the state. I don't think it's very common, but we found one pretty much uh, had just died on the road in front of it. They're still pretty fresh and luna moths are pretty common out there. Um, and then these are just a few of the other things that we see while we're there. There's a lot, lot, lot more that there's a lot of work that could be done on the on the small moths of the Uaris region. A lot of butterflies. Then, of course, I don't see hoary edge skippers very, very often in the state of North Carolina. It's just not a common butterfly, but I've seen them a few times uh, in the Uaris. Here are some other skippers, and the skippers are kind of like the sparrows of the butterfly world, and if people's eyes glaze over when you when you show them, but but they're actually, you know, they're actually, you know, four different species here. So uh, you just have to spend a little time getting to know them. <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, one of the fun ones that we see out there is this long tailed skipper up here. Um, and I'm showing this as well as the southern skipper lane down here, which is a really small and about the size of my thumbnail. Um, and I'm showing you the map because here we are, you know, here's the edge of this in North Carolina, and my arrow is on Randolph County. So where I'm working is in northern Randolph County. The Uaris is, is, you know, is, comes through um, this area on down here. So we're on the edge of this butterfly's range. So there we are. We, you know, we found it on the property. It fits the map. But we, this long-tailed skipper is a tropical species, and it shows up in our region, but not not every year. But it, it's um, one that comes up from Florida and Georgia, and, and as uh, it's, you know, they start laying eggs in the spring. And similar to a monarch, when the when the brood hatches out, the next the next group of adults will start moving north a little bit, pushing north. So by late summer, we start to see things like long-tailed skippers in our in our region, but again, not every year. Another another butterfly that that behaves like the long-tailed skippers is called fritillary. It's a tropical one, but but again, some years we see them out on the property or in the Piedmont of North Carolina, but not necessarily every year. And and some of these are also like this uh, this one over on the right, this checker spot. We're at the edge of its breeding range of pipe vine swallowtails, more of a southern app species, but we see them more and more in the Piedmont because people plant species that um, uh, they, uh, the larvae feed on Dutchman's pipe and more and more people plant those in gardens and nurseries and these butterflies have, have been tracking it. So here's that silvery checker spot. Again, here we are working in this region and you know we're, we're right on the edge of, uh, of its range. And so the map I showed you before, that species range was the coastal plain into the Piedmont, the silvery checker spot is in the mountains and into the Piedmont. And that's what I was talking about before with the scarlet and summer tanager. This could be scarlet tanager and the other butterfly could have been summer tanager where they overlap. They overlap right here in the URS region. The, uh, the little butterfly called the northern northern pearly eye, it's a woodland, it's a forest species. They don't nectar at flowers. They feed on sap or even at animal dung. They will uh, get their nutrition that way as an adult. Um, and again, here's the range where it gets just into the Piedmont, barely into some coastal plain counties. Um, here you see the map is white as like because I haven't, I need to submit my data because this is where we're working. And that's where my photo is from. <clears throat> And then a few other interesting little critters um, that we get on the property. Just to, just to, again, a lot of different kinds of things. And I'll show you the map of this one because it's not, it's kind of scattered across this beetle. It's scattered across North Carolina. So here's here's the range map for that 
particular beetle. And again, there's it's not been documented for Randolph County, but it has now. I just need to let people know. Um, and and you know that's what we try to do is just fill in the distribution of these species in uh, around the in this case around North Carolina. And a group of different flies. Um, I love the the bee wing flies. I like the hover flies. Uh, this is one of the uh, horse flies, but it's not aggressive like some of the bigger ones. <clears throat> and it doesn't have a common name. Sorry about that. The phone ring. Um, this one up here, it looks a little funny because I didn't realize it till later. It's missing its eyes because it hit one of it hit our net. Usually. Usually I can get things out of the nets okay and release them. And when I took this one out, I didn't realize that it had already, the netting had torn its poor eyes out. But I, I photographed it and um, went looking to figure out what it was. And it turned out to be this thing called a tropical plushback, which is more of a South American fly, but has been found in a number of states across the eastern seaboard. So there were records from Tennessee, Virginia, not many. And South Carolina and a few from North Carolina, not many, but um, you know, apparently it's one of these accidental introductions, I guess. <clears throat> um, but but again, it's inter it's nice to be able to put it onto a, a site like iNaturalist or over to biodiversity.com website, and we start to build our our knowledge base around these observations. Okay, uh, there have only been a few a few records for North Carolina. And there's a lot of pollinators um, out there, wasp are, uh, a lot of the wasp are pollinators. So uh, I, uh, in, between my, in between my bird work, I spent a little time trying to, again, document all these things and put them in iNaturalist. This one, I was pretty excited when I saw it because I didn't recognize it and it just looked really cool. And it is looking, it looks really cool. But I found out, uh, I was a little disappointed when I figured out that it is a, a type of rosin bee that is not native, not native to the region. Um, and it's fairly new as a non-native. And what people are saying is they don't, they don't know what to expect in terms of competing with our other native bees and wasps. Um, I'm still working on this one. There are two species that look very similar. This is some type of ignumen wasp. Uh, but that was a couple of years ago. I just kind of, I actually forgot that I uh, needed to figure out which one, which one this is, one of two species. But um, in, in, in either case, again, it was one of those where we just we don't have a lot of records for it. Um, there's some beetles that are in the area, and I went ahead and picked some of the more colorful ones. And I, I, I think these guys up here, the dogbane leaf beetle, that might be one of my favorites. Pretty cool, although they, uh, the rainbow scarab here, no slouch. But these these leaf beetles, they change color when you tilt them because the, the light hits there their shell there and it re refracts the light in different ways. It's sort of like a hummingbird. Um, you turn them and you get these different colors. Pretty cool. Um, this is a native ladybird bee that, you know, most of the ones we see are the non-native Asian ladybird beetles, but this is this is a native one. <clears throat> and this is the uh, glowworm, close-up of the adult glowworm. Male, I guess. I guess this is a female. There are, there are, as you'd expect, we've got the, the streams and the Uri River out there, so an open space that so we've got we've got dragonflies, um, and and all the all the usual suspects. We you know we see them out there, but we also because of our nets, we occasionally catch things like um, like these, which are I'm not going to say they're rare. They're just probably rarely reported because they're in situations where it's hard to document them. You you have to be good at swinging a butterfly net or just have or have another way of luring them in or, or catching them. They're typically along the rivers. Um, we just happen to have a couple of nets down by where we have small streams and we've caught a couple of these. And again, dragonflies are, are uh, like some of the other bugs. We're usually able to get them out of the net okay and release them safely. And that was the case for these two. Um, one day um, I was sitting after leading a walk, I had time to have a little snack and I was parked right along the Uri River and this bat flew by and landed just 30 feet above me in this tulip tree. I couldn't believe it. It must have been flushed by maybe a hawk or an owl. The barred owls are out active during the day and it, we were at the edge of the forest. So it must have been flushed by one of those and it flew right over and landed. So it turned out to be a hoary bat, which 
we don't have a lot of information about hoary bats, but I was able to get some really good picture of this poor guy. And you can see this thing does not want to be out in the light. It's trying to cover up, go back to sleep. Um, but it was a great, great opp opportunity to, to get a really good visual of this thing. And then, of course, we got we got a variety of herbs. Um, so a lot of um, uh, American and Fowler toads are out there, other species too. Uh, skinks are there. Um, C5 line and broadheaded. Um, I put a question mark here because back back in the day, I really wasn't sure, you know, who this guy was. Um, <clears throat> Jeff tells me the broad uh, the five lines get like that. Um, our herpetologist. Uh, fence lizards. We see those fairly regularly. A couple of salamanders, um, the marbles, and that's an interesting salamander, and they are in the ephemeral pool. So there are a number of places on the national forest, probably on private land too, but in the national forest where there are these ephemeral pools, these uh, depressions that get that hold water in late fall when we get some rain, and there's and the vegetation's not growing, the water sits through. And they lay eggs, and those young grow up, and then by early spring they're they're back in the mud and leaf litter. So they live a very interesting number of salamanders live a very interesting life cycle. And if you if you don't know that whole life cycle, you don't realize how important these ephemeral pools are. You think, well, it's just a maybe a place where mosquitoes breed, but that's that's not not it. There's a lot of organisms and other frogs and things that are dependent on these ephemeral pools. The salamander, this salamander is in the streams. And a, uh, a variety of snakes out there. We, uh, this is a, a hognose snake. This one's not dead, it's playing dead. That's what hognose snakes do. Water snakes, uh, again, we're near water, so we're bound to have water snakes. Um, some other interesting ones, so, um, Here's a water snake up here, but notice the pattern on these other two. This is a milk snake, and um, over here is a, a corn snake that was dead on the road. I, I haven't seen one alive, but in the Uari's region, the corn snakes have this silvery gray background, whereas in other parts of the state, it's, it, it, they would look more like this. They have more of a, you know, a, a brown background with these chestnut patches, but how in the Uari's, it's this silver background. Anyway, here's a here's a three species and they all look similar, similar pattern. But they live very differently. Here's another snake. I'll give you a minute to find it. <clears throat> um, little, little head is sticking out here. Uh, the green snake, the rough green snake. I took it out to get a better picture. I don't see many of these. You can understand why. <laughs> it's usually an accident. That one, that one was, I was just walking through that thing in the in the shrub um there are there are some venomous snakes in the region so copperheads are out there and uh, as well as a tim there's a type of it's a like a population of timber rattlesnake uh this young one just happened to be on the um there's a house on the property where we work and it was on the back porch one night in the fall um we picked it up and moved it back into the into the woods but it's a it's a cool snake. The adults, this is what they look like. So here's one that I found up on the in the national forest. I love uh I just love the look of this thing. It's beautiful line, this reddish brown line through it. Um this thing sat there all morning. I was tracking a bird and I walked back and forth all morning tracking this little warbler, a little black throated green warbler up on the up on the ridge, up on the top of the mountain, but I and I was down on the slope, then I'd come back up and over and go to the other side just following this bird around. There were two birds up there. I was following them, but this guy just sat there the whole morning watching me uh, go by. And, uh, you know, they, that's what they do. But I will say, this is one of the best regions. Uh, the Uari's region has, has a lot of timber rattlesnakes, so it's a, it's a great stronghold for the species. I mentioned the cliff swallows before, so here is that that the colony under, over the Uari River on Highway 109, they build these little oven-shaped mud nests. Um, it is entertaining to watch them do what they do. So here's a bird bringing, bringing a piece of mud and building it out, and it will have a little 
like flute flute coming out and a little opening for it. But they're uh, they nest. They will get into some pretty big colonies. I think I counted seventy five active nests out there a few years ago. So there they are. Uh, I was out there one time in early May when they were doing the nest building. So they're flying in here at the bank of the Ori River where there's some wet mud and they're picking up picking up pieces. There they are. I don't know if this will show, but that's what they do when it's time. Males and females look alike. I'm not sh I haven't read up to see. I pre they, they probably both help build the nest, but there you go. So it's a great spot, uh, again, for combination. You know, there's plants and animals and human activity, a lot of natu natural resources and a lot of ways to enjoy those natural resources. And I show this just because here is a little gas station I used to go to to get gas and ice cream. Um, they had Wi-Fi, too, back in the day when I needed Wi-Fi. Um, and so there's a lot to be done out here. There's, again, you, uh, you can also canoe and kayak. Or the old mines are some you can go and visit, the old gold mines, the forestry, the state parks, the horse trails, a lot to be done. So there's a lot of nice interaction between the natural resources and the cultural resources out there. There's a barn swallow. It's just they always nest uh, at the gas station there. I've taken, like I said, I've taken groups out. I've uh, had a lot of uh, young people that I've taken out both to explore as well as uh, help me do some of the research that I did. And these are some of my colleagues. So uh, some of the trips we've been on. Uh, um, so Casey with the Wildlife Resources Commission as well. Alicia was one of my students at Guilford. Kelly with, was with the Wildlife Resources Commission. She's now with Department of Agriculture. These are some of the... Uh, Young people, they were teenagers when they were working with me um, to get out there. Um, she's downstairs right now doing some work. <laughs> um, Gabriella is a Piedmont habitat coordinator and works with private lands by uh, owners as well to do habitat management. Um, Casey works with uh, local municipalities to do conservation plans when they're doing development. So these are folks that work with me on this project. It is a private property. And there are other private properties in the region who are interested in what we do is her uh, Gabrielle daughter working with us too. Now she's been out there, um, she's only 11 now, but she's been coming out for the last two years learning how to do this stuff as well. So I get a lot of help. It's a, it's really been a great collaboration with all these different folks to get, to get this uh, work done. So with that, if I can take any questions, Chris, and I can stop sharing as well, if you'd like. Awesome stuff. Thank you, John. Yeah, we'll take some questions from the chat, folks. Uh, we've got uh, just a few minutes here in our time together. So go ahead, if you haven't already, drop your questions in the chat. And John, yeah, you can take down the, the screen share. The first one that I've got for you, John, is... Uh, do you know of any good resources to try to learn more about the geology of the Uwaris and beyond? Because it seems like uh, good resources for non-geologists aren't plenty. You know, that's a good point. And um, I'm lucky because I work with it here at the museum. We have a geologist. And when I had questions, I went two doors down and knocked on his door to say, Chris, I, I got some questions. I did some reading online. Um, there was there was a a textbook that I got a hold of uh, about North Carolina geology, but I don't know the answer to that. But I would say that I'm gonna have to send a note to you know our museums. Ask a naturalist. Uh, we have a we have a, an email, and you can send in your request, and they will route it to the right to the right person. So. That that would be my suggestion is, is send a note to the museum's information line and they'll get it. They'll get it to Chris and he'll be able to tell us if there if there is some of that, because it is a fascinating. There's a lot more to the story. Um, I, you know, when I go online to look for stuff, you can find it, but it's in different places at different publications. Some of it is the technical journals and that sort of thing. But it would um, my guess is there's some more 
there's got to be some more general stuff. So I would just say, send us a note and Chris will help out. Sounds good. Uh, not, not me, Chris, by the way, Dr. Chris Tacker, geologist here at the museum. I won't be able Absolutely. to help, although I can forward your email to Chris Tacker. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's see. Another one that came in was, uh, have you discovered new species in the region? Have you been able to, to describe anything from the area? No. And, um, there might, there probably are, um, <clears throat> because I don't think it's been really, really exposed explored heavily but it would come from it would have to be an arthropod that sort of thing or it might be a crayfish something in the water um there have been some pretty rare things found like i you know i recall i've documented some endangered bivalve at least one species that's considered endangered in the uri river it's right there but uh i'm my focus is birds so we do we pretty much know the birds that what we do now is things like, well, something like the black throated green, somebody does some genetic work because there's an isolated population, we might elevate uh, a population to full species. But uh, but I'm focused on mostly on birds. And then I'm just getting photographs of these other things just to put them into places like iNaturalist or ncbiodiversity.com. And I might put something in there sometime and not know what it is. And uh, but I'll leave it for somebody else to identify and who knows that might be might be something new i suspect if somebody did a little more focal work they might find some new things <clears throat> but it would be something like an art uh, one of the arthropods or you know if i had to do it over again i'd be an entomologist <laughs> oh <laughs> uh well i mean it seems like you're doing pretty good as a as an entomologist right now too yeah. given how many pictures of uh bugs and arthropods we saw in your slideshow yeah, not bad for a hobbyist, but man, you can imagine what else is there if you got serious about it. <laughs> this is very true. Uh, let's see. How does biodiversity in this region compare to other regions like the Sand Hills or the Coastal Plain? Well, they all have they all have something, and that I, I mean that's what's so great about it. I I don't know as far as like numbers of species. You know, there's two ways that I think of biodiversity. One is just the, the sheer number. The other is Sort of a how they make a living. So is you might have say fewer species, but they are more specialized in what they do. I, I I would you know kind of give them maybe a little more credit when they're having to eke out a living in a little bit a little harder way, so to speak. So different ways of looking at it. Um, but but there you know we are so close to the sand hills. There's also some overlap there too. But, but there, there are some things in the sand hill because the microhabitat is different. There are things there that just don't get into the large region. Um, my guess is that because of the way things blend, if you if you you'd have to you know you have to draw a line around these areas and decide what exactly is going to be your region. Say in the URs, um, you know, you probably you probably get a few more things showing up in the URs just because there's that overlap you know, overlap between different um, regions, but but they all have a lot of stuff. So, um, you know, when I've worked up in this, you know, like in the Southern Alps, that's that really depends on how you define it, because if you're at 3000 feet, you're going to have more, more birds, for example. But when we were working on a project at 5000 feet, there are many fewer species of birds at 5000 feet, but but they're adapted for 5,000 feet. So um, there's that going for them, but far fewer birds. But if you drew a circle around, uh, you know, Yancey and uh, Buncombe County, and you can go, you can go from 1,000 feet elevation all the way up to 6,000 feet. So that's going to give you a lot more. So kind of de de depends on how you define them. Right, right. All right. Well, John, thanks for uh, this awesome like nature primer on a pretty cool region of our state. You're welcome. I encourage people to go on out there, take part of it. Like I said, there's a lot of places like the parks, the national forest, the wilderness, the zoo, a lot of places to go see, enjoy, or a gold mine, an old gold mine. Or an old gold mine. Sounds like a, sounds like a good weekend. So everybody, uh, 
in addition to getting outside and visiting the Uwaris, I hope that we'll see you again here at the Lunchtime Discovery Series. We'll be back here again next Wednesday at noon with a presentation from the museum's research curator for non-molluscan invertebrates. That's Dr. Bronwyn Williams. That will begin here at noon next Wednesday. So go ahead, mark your calendars. Check out naturalsciences.org where you can see the schedule of events for the Lunchtime Discovery Series and more programs. And the Office of Environmental Education's website is eenorthcarolina.org, where you can also see their schedule of events. And at their website, uh, you can sign up for the email list for this lecture series. That way you get the link to participate in your inbox every Wednesday. Until next time, folks, take care, stay safe, and uh, enjoy getting outdoors in this lovely fall weather. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody.